and Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, Dr. Vincent obtained his research doctorate degree at Imperial College London. Uh, his academic interests are in clinical nutrition, obesity, and endocrinology. He has published widely and he is an editorial board member for Pathology Portal, Health, Education, England, and RCPPAP, Translational Metabolic Syndrome Research, and Fundraising Clinic Endocrinology. Uh, I'm proud to mention that many Sri Lankan consultant chemical pathologists had their overseas training under Dr. Royce at King's College Hospital, London. Today, Dr. Royce is going to talk about gut brain axis and obesity. Dear Dr. Royce, thank you for allocating your time for us in, in spite of your busy schedule. We are grateful for your presence here today and I'm sure that this will be a valuable experience for all attendees present in this meeting today. Over to you, Dr. Royce. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. You can hear, hear you. me fine. Okay, brilliant. And you can see my slides? Slides are not moving. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm on the first slide anyway. So okay, thank you. Thank you. Good. So I'm going to present to you about the gut brain axis and its influence on obesity and for the next 45 minutes um, and we will have question time at the end so if you look at obesity it's defined as body mass index of over 30 kg per meter squared as per who and we know it's now an epidemic unfortunately and it's expected to rise to nearly 300 million by 2035 if you look at the data from England in 2019, you could see that nearly 29% of adults are classified as obese. And unfortunately, even 20% of children under around six years are classified as obese. So it is a problem not only in the adults, but also in the younger age group. It does influence a number of hospital admissions and also clearly that will have a huge financial burden on the healthcare system in the UK and globally. However, obesity is not focused just on Western countries. You could see the data from Sri Lanka, which was, I was just obtained. I think this is from 2015. You could see there's a steady increase in obesity in both male and female. And as across the globe, the most, the highest number of obesity is seen in those around 40 to 65 years of age. And that's very consistent. We could kind of look at the environmental factors and see whether it's, that is a real cause for obesity. Clearly, unlike our ancestors who is, used to run after the food and had to go without food for a number of months, we have the luxury of picking up food off the shelf and eating 24 7. So, definitely, it could be a contributor. And also, there has been a lot of criticism on the uh, food industry. As you can see, over time, the portion sizes have increased as well as the fat and sugar content in our diet. The consequences of obesity is quite drastic. If you look at these slides, you could see in both men and women, plotting the BMI in the axis here, you could see if you look at cardiovascular disease, orange line, cancer, green line, or all other causes of mortality, showing white line, in both men and female, the moment your BMI starts rising, there's an exponential increase in mortality. As well as mortality, obesity presents with multiple comorbidities. So you could have diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, asthma, arthritis, again, increasing the degree of obesity. And for, the, for every five point increase in BMI over 25, it's been noted as a 30% increase in mortality. And I guess COVID also again has put the spotlight on obesity and highlighted the need for us to address this epidemic. So there have been multiple studies confirming that having an increase in AC 
ACE2 receptor expression, especially in the adipose tissue, and the chronic inflammatory state and the dysfunctional immune system in those living with obesity does lead to poorer outcomes and IQ admission. So let's focus a bit more on physiology. Is it just a matter of somebody consuming more calories and not burning enough calories? Is it as simple as that? So when it comes to obesity treatment, we have, we can group it into three main categories. The lifestyle, it will always remain the main focus across the causes of obesity. So diet modification exercise are crucial. And we know in spite, not only does it bring weight loss, but also other metabolic benefits. When it comes to pharmacotherapy, we are quite limited. We had a tablet called Olifax, which was used uh, for a number of years, and it does give some decent results in those who can tolerate the medication. However, there have been great advances in the medication industry. So we got the glucogon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist, liraglutide. It's a subcutaneous injection, and King's is one of the first hospitals in UK to provide this as a treatment for obesity. And clearly, we've got bariatric surgery. If you focus a bit more on the homeostasis of weight loss, say somebody's got a BMI of 40 and with very strict diet and lifestyle modifications, they manage to lower their body mass index down to 30. And that's possible. And as you will know, if you speak to most of the patients, they do find it, I would say at least a proportion, find it easy to lose weight. However, the challenge lies once you've reached your reduced weight because the body's homeostatic response promotes weight regain rather than maintaining weight loss. And that's how our body is made. So at the moment, bariatric surgery is the most effective treatment for treating morbid obesity. This was very well established by the Swedish obese subject study. It was published initially in the England Journal of Medicine. And just to focus your attention, the blue line, the presence of control arm. So these are the patients who had lifestyle and even uh, available pharmacotherapy at that time. And they were closely monitored in clinic. And then we got three other lines here, which represent various types of bariatric surgery or weight loss surgery. And what I like you to bring your attention to is that bariatric surgery gives you significant weight loss within the first one to two years, but more importantly, sustained weight loss. Some degree of weight regain is natural. That is, as I mentioned, is the body's way of defending your weight. However, they never get back to the baseline they could have been if they did not have surgery. So in order to address the obesity epidemic, we need to understand the complex neurohormonal mechanisms that regulate appetite and balance. It could be simply stated as energy intake and energy expenditure, but it's more to it, unfortunately. So we've got the adipose tissue signals, we've got the gut signals from the pancreas or the intestine, the genetic makeup and, of an individual, certain medications, and even environmental factors, so inactive lifestyle, psychosocial factors, they all contribute to this complex mechanism. So the reason I'm mentioning bariatric surgery is because it has kind of helped enhance our understanding of the gut-brain axis. So we're learning a lot more from the physiological changes of the bariatric surgery, which is helping us to understand how we could modify some of the gut peptides, and which can be targeted for treatment and bring about weight loss. So just to give an overview, a simplistic diagram is after bariatric surgery, we know altered metabolism of bile acids, gut hormones, which I'll be focusing in the next few slides, and the gut microbiota are significantly altered, and they all have been shown to play key roles in not only bringing about weight loss, but also increasing the glucose metabolism after surgery. So what are these gut hormones? So they consist of growth of hormones secreted by the cells called entoendocrine cells, which are found throughout the gut, namely stomach, pancreas, intestine, small and large, and they control various functions of the GI tract, like mobility, secretion, gastric outlet uh, movement. So it's, it's multiple functions. 
So we're talking about gut hormones. So how, but if you go and Google the endocrine system, this is what you normally get. So where does the gut fit in? Actually, the gut is the largest endocrine organ. And it's not new information. We've known this for years because CPK, for is a pining, was one of the peptides initially isolated way back in 1930s. And if you look at the discovery of gut hormones over the years, you can see that the number of gut hormones that are identified with various defined roles. Therefore, the gut does represent an endocrine organ. What about the gut hormones specific for appetite regulation? So these are the ones we currently know, which have been widely published. You'll be glad to know, I'm not going to go through each and every one today, we don't have time, but just to show some of the sites of origin. So from the stomach, you get the ghrelin or gastrin, and from the duodenum, you've got CPK, secretin, PIC, motrin, and then further down as you go to the gut, I find the origin of certain peptides. Ones we are really interested today are the satiety gut hormones, called the GLP-1, the oxygen to modulin PYY, and here we know there are important hormones from the pancreas as well, which are involved in energy metabolism. So we, we need to understand exactly where the centers are within the brain and how this speaks to the gut. So within the brain, as we know, hypothalamus is a key organ of a collection of neurons, which actually regulate all the energy homeostasis and food intake. So there are key collection of neurons within hypothalamus, the arcuate nucleus, the paraventricular nucleus, dorsal medial nucleus, ventral medial and lateral hypothalamus areas. So basically lots of signals are received by the arcuate nucleus and the brain stem, the NTS within the brain stem and signaling between them and the whole entire hypothalamus it regulates the way our energy is metabolized, how we identify the body's storage of energy in the form of adipose tissue, and also how we recognize calorific intake in the forms of gut peptides from the gut. So it could be either from the stomach or from the intestine. Taking a closer look at hypothalamus, we know that alpha nucleus is crucial for this signaling molecule. Uh, I've got the abbreviations here so for parity. However, within arcuate nucleus, we know there are two distinct halves. One is the NPY ADRC collector neurons, and one is the FOMC and CART neurons. Anything which stimulates the FOMC CART decreases appetite, makes you feel full, and anything which stimulates the NPY ADRP increases the appetite, makes you hungry. Let's move on to some of the specific hormones to kind of see how they're involved in appetite regulation and why we know that gut brain is crucial in this whole food intake and behavioral changes. Let's focus on ghrelin first. It is the only known hunger hormone. It's secreted from the endo endocrine cells called SA, like cells in both in the stomach and epithelial cells at the pancreas. It regulates the distribution and rate of use of energy. It stimulates appetite via arcuate nucleus. It is also re released by the pituitary, pituitary and it is essential for cognitive adaptation, changing environment and the process of learning. So it's not just purely on appetite regulation, but it's got other functions. And this is what makes it more complex. And that's why it's hard to target obesity treatment because they should have multiple functions and cause certain side effects. How do we know that ghrelin is the meal initiator? So in this study, what you can see is the ghrelin response over time. And you're looking at it pre-prandially and post-prandially. So you could see, and just to show the timing of the ghrelin measurement, you could see the insulin goes up with meal intake. So that's your breakfast, lunch, dinner. And you could see the ghrelin kind of peaks just before your food intake. So that's what drives hunger, as we know. So there's a spike in ghrelin, and then it settles after your food intake. It spikes again just before your hunger for lunch. 
about this time for you, I guess, this one person in Sri Lanka, and then it again spikes again before dinner. And what after you take food, it settles and it's unattractive. We also proved it by certain studies where you get the same individuals on different days. You either inject them with saline or with ghrelin and ask them to have a buffet kind of meal. On the days that they were injected ghrelin, you could say every individual ate is the person the same person, so they all ate more food when they were given a ghrelin injection. And you know, ghrelin reflects a chronic nutritional status, so elevated in lean and suppressed in obese. So that's also quite an important finding. So you find ghrelin to be lower in your beef. I'll come to that point later on. And also, the key point here is the postprandial suppression of ghrelin is noted in the lean individuals, but not in the obese individuals. So even though the obese seem to have a slightly lower ghrelin, it doesn't seem to suppress with your food intake as much as it does with the lean subjects. That could explain the ongoing drive of hunger. And also, Prada Willi syndrome. I've noted you have high fasting ghrelin levels. You know, Prada really the the CPK. The next hormone I'm going to focus on is secreted from the eye cells of the duodenum. It's stimulated by protein and fat intake. That also releases a gut digestive enzymes as well as constricts the bile, the gallbladder to release your bile. It inhibits gastric emptying and gastric acid secretion. So as you can see, inhibiting those functions can make you feel full and bring about satiety. It's got a very half-life, half so it's only phase in the circulation for two minutes. So it's a very short-term regulation of appetite. The next one is pancreatic polypeptide. It comes from the S cells of the pancreas. Again, it's increased after protein lipid. It's increased after exercise. Uh, PP levels are known to be low in the obese, but high in the anorexic. So again, it could explain some of the ongoing decreased satiety status in the obese and the increased satiety in the anorexic. It's considered a long-term suppressor of appetite. Mm -hmm. Let's focus on the insulin So you know if you have the same concentration of glucose orally or intravenously, the oral intake brings about a better or more significant increase in your insulin levels compared to the intravenous administration. And this is purely down to the insulin effects because we know when you have the glucose in your gut, there are other signaling pathways. So you've got both the insulin secretion and you also got what we call the insulin hormone, especially the GLP-1, which stimulates your beta cells in the pancreas to create more insulin. So it's a two-prong attack of one, the gut sensing the glucose, as well as the extra hormone stimulating the pancreas. So you get a higher peak of insulin. And some of the important ingredients uh, are the GIP. They come from the case cells of the duodenum and oxygen duodenum. It's stimulated by glucose fat. It promotes energy storage in the adipose tissue. And like GLP-1, the way they bring about the insulin effect is because they upregulate the beta, beta cell gene. They increase the glucose-dependent insulin secretion. They increase the beta cell proliferation and also decrease the apoptosis of the beta cells. Therefore, you've got a higher mass of beta cells, so it's more insulin. But the more potent Incretin hormone is a GLP-1. It comes from the endocrine L cells of the gut, as well as the CNS. Its receptors are found throughout the brain. So you've got the NPS in the brain stem and also the hypothalamus. It's released postprandially. It increases satiety, decreases hunger, and decreases gastric secretion. It's very rapidly deactivated by an enzyme called DCP4, and that's quite specific, significant. I'll come to that later on in my talk. So the GLP-1 effect on the human is multi, multi level. So you've got the beta cell function as an incretin hormone. You also have 
the bell signaling, as I mentioned, for improved promotes satiety and reduces appetite. And there are a few other functions. We don't have time to go through all of them today. Another key hormone is oxygen modeling. It also inhibits gastric acid secretion. It reduces food intake, increases energy expenditure, which is quite important. Because if you speak to most of your patients who have been dieting for a while, they would see they're feeling a bit cold, and that's because the body is trying to conserve energy. However, oxygen modeling has been shown to increase energy expenditure. So it looks like it could work in two different ways. It increases satiety, and also it helps you to burn the calories. It acts by a GLT-1 receptor, so very closely resembles the GLT-1 particle. And there have been very promising results using it as an anti obesity medication. I've shown one of the studies here. So basically, oxygen modeling is shown in the red line and the gray line in the yellow line. And we are looking at number of weeks of treatment and weight loss. So you could see the patients who are on oxygen modeling treatment lost significant weight by four weeks compared to those who were on the line. And even after you stopped the injection, there was some residual weight loss effect on the patients who had oxygen modeling. PYY is another very key satiety hormone and very widely published and studied. So it was found in 1985. So it goes back a while. It circulates in two forms, the inactive form, PYY1336, and the active form, PYY336. So the Y here denotes tyrosine, so basically peptide tyrosine tyrosine, that's the full name of this hormone. It's released from the GI tract in proportion to the caloric load. So the more calories you eat, the more PYY it is secreted. Also, looking at studies in the rats, uh, we know that the data gives fair line of higher concentrations of PYY and look at the food intake, there's significant reduction in food intake with higher dose of PYY. As you can see, there's fair line and then the high doses of PYY. We separated from the L cells, so again, we're seeing the L cells coming up quite a bit. So the L cells actually separate the modeling GLT1 and PYY. So they're quite a crucial cell in the whole gut brain axis in terms of society. And the obese patients are known to have lower levels than mean. So again, the satiety response is attenuated in these patients. And also very importantly, you can see in the love of the state is high, in those with short bowel is high. And inflammatory bowel disease, and even in the elderly. So, some people suggest that could be a reason why you find decreased appetite in the elderly. So, these are some of the studies I've been involved with. So, basically, what we've done here is we've had PYY infusion at uh, different concentrations. So, we had three subjects. So, uh, 12 subjects, and they get, we give them six doses each. So, here you've got the uh, calorie intake percentage, and you've got the spray line proof, and you've got higher doses of PYY infusion. And as you can see, the higher the dose of PYY, you get decreased food intake. So these are like buffet meals. So you give the infusion and then you ask them to eat as much as you want. So it's quite significant. You can see in this graph also where the calorie intake significantly decreases with a PYY concentration. The other question was, is it actually the calorie content or the volume of the food which causes higher secretion of PYY? So this was nicely looked at by comparing to volume of meals. So we had 20 lean and 20 obese patients. And each one got three meals. So we gave them 500 meals of meal with different calorie contact, 200, 500, and 1,000 kilocalories. And also 900 meals of food to give a higher volume. But again, making sure we matched 
sum of the calories, 12,000, 2,000, 3,000. And what you can see is the PYY equation was very similar. If you look at these two four points, it was similar in both the lean and the obese on the calories rather than the volume. And again, importantly, the lean patients had a higher PYY response compared to the obese patients. So we could simplify the whole diagram, even though it's not that simple. So you can see the ghrelin signaling the brain to say, yeah, you're hungry, it's time to have a snack. And once you've had a snack, you've got the other gut peptides, PYY, DLT1 in the modeling and other, the Vegas simulation, they all play a part and they signal back to the brain to say, stop, you've had enough to eat. I've summarized some of the the functions of these plus hormones. Again, not going to read them out to you today, but I'll be sharing copies of the slides so you can have to note. So what about gut hormones in the real world? This is always the case, you know, we've got this nice study showing how they can work, but does it actually translate in real life? So here we have patients who had bariatric surgery, so gastric bypass surgery, and then we've got normal weight patients and obese. Okay, so we are looking at grain here and we're looking at it over time. So we're giving them lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you can see the grain is higher prior to breakfast in the normal weight compared to the obese. Okay, but importantly, after meals, the drop is less pronounced in the obese rather than the normal way. So the drop is much higher in the normal way. So they get full sooner, whereas that drive is not diminished in the obese group. But when you see the gastric bypass group, so the bariatric surgery group, drilling is nearly flat. And that could explain why they don't feel as hungry throughout the day and why they could be eating less. So what about the PYY response after bariatric surgery? So you've got four groups here. You've got the lean controls, the Ruan Y gastric bypass, laparoscopic gastric banding, and the uh, obese controls. So you could see the lean, the obese, Ruan Y, and Lux band in the different colors here. And let's focus on the light blue line, which is the lean. So that is a normal response. So after a meal, you would expect PYY to increase so you can. It brings about the satiety signal. In those who are obese, we can see this is quite flat, so it's attenuated. Laparoscopic banding doesn't do much to this hormone uh, because it doesn't actually alter the anatomy other than cause a bit of constriction at the upper part of the stomach. But after Ruan Y gastric bypass, there is an accelerated response of PYY, could explain, and a very rapid increase of PYY. That could explain why we feel full sooner after surgery. And a very similar response in GLP-1. So if I didn't have this title on the top and we looked at both the graphs, you could see they're very, very similar. So it's the same colors for plus amino And basically it's because they both come from the same endocrine L cell. So why does this change after the bypass? So let's just focus on the bypass. Uh, I'm not having enough time to go through the sleeve at the moment. So if you've got the normal GI tract, your food comes here, your ghrelin is already secreted prior to meal intake. And so, and once you have the food, it goes down your intestine, it stimulates your PYYG1, which go back to the brain signal to stop food intake, and that's what happens. When you got the gastric bypass, you're bypassing the bit of the stomach with the fish ghrelin, so the amount of ghrelin signaling is diminished, as we've seen in the graph before. And also, importantly, the food gets to the terminal ileum where you've got more of the endocrine L cells much quicker. The fact that it gets there much quicker, and the fact that it goes in an undiluted form because it's bypassing the entire stomach, it's bypassing Jodinum. So it's going in a high concentration of calorie content and also getting there quicker. That will explain why you've got this accelerated PYY DLT1 response as well as a quicker response. 
quite thick and it's very hard. But gastric banding, you don't get that. So gastric banding in a very simplistic fashion, very purely done at the perspective where preventing food intake. So basically, you've got this uh, balloons or the bands which are placed where just below where the esophagus opens into the stomach, causing a pinch point. And it's got a little tube with a port, and the port sits up to tenuously next to your belly button. And the reason for keeping it there is by changing the volume of fluid in that port with that syringe and needle, which is easily accessible because it's subcutaneous. You could, by injecting more fluid, you can make the band tight. And if it's too tight, you could retract some of the fluid from here and it gets loose. And that's how you manage this patient. But again, it doesn't cause any alteration to your gut plumbing. Therefore, there's no changes in the gut. To prove this uh, in a very like a reverse mechanism kind of way, what we looked at is we looked at patients who lost more weight after bariatric surgery. So not all patients lose weight. And that is, again, we need to understand why. But in this particular case, we are going to see patients who lost more weight. So these are the good responders. And all the others, the poor responders, they didn't lose the amount of weight that you would expect them to. And we looked at their GLT-1 postprandial uh, peak. And you can see those who lost more weight had higher GLT-1 concentration, which is a variant compared to the poor responders. And another way to challenge this is by reversing it physiologically. So what we did was we had patients who had gastric banding and patients who had gastric bypass, and we injected them with oxytide. As you know, oxytide is a very global suppressor of most gut peptides. Okay, so, so we compared them with saline. So basically, you make a in, you either inject them with saline or oxytide, they're blinded to it and you ask them to have a buffet kind of meal. So if you look at the gastric binding patients, you give them saline of oxytide, doesn't actually change the amount they can eat. And this is the point I was trying to make because it doesn't actually alter your gut peptide. So there is no significant impact on the gut brain access. However, if you look at the bypass group, the day you give saline, um, they ate less compared to the days you give oxytide. So when you give oxytide, you're suppressing the fourth prandial GLT1 PYY, so they're able to eat more. So we had a few patients who lost significant amount of weight after surgery, and because it was making them unwell, we'd actually treated them with oxytide to help them bring some of the appetite back. And another interesting phenomenon is what we see as the I don't enjoy burgers anymore syndrome. So basically, you've got patients before O and Y gastric bypass where they, they prefer to have fatty meals. But after surgery, they go for a more healthy option. Is it because they made a choice to have surgery and choose better dietary options? Or is it is there more to it? So that's that's the main thing here. So it could be a combination of both, and that's what we believe. Because when you look at people with obesity, they got a higher activation of the reward centers, the head and the brain, especially for high amounts of sugar and fat. But after when I get to bypass, they just find too much fat or sugar unpalatable. And it could be multiple factors. It could be because of altered intestinal transit, because we know this gut peptide, they got transit. It could be because they get some people get dumping syndrome after eating high amount of sugars after bariatric surgery, or is it the gut hormone? Is it again back to the gut hormone? Because we know there are GLP one receptors in the brain. Okay. Interesting study we've done is doing a functional MRI scan, and as you know, functional MRI looks at different chemical changes within the brain. And what we did is while the patients were in a MRI scanner, you flash images in front of them. So you put some unpleasant pictures and some unpleasant pictures, pictures of babies or something unpleasant. And then 
and the, the child similar, but with different food stuff and before and after surgery. And in the patients after when I get the bypass, the reward center, the way it lit up, the fatty food was very different to how it was in those who did not have surgery or before surgery. So clearly, the reward centers are altered after bariatric surgery. Therefore, the gut brain axis could also play an important role in the pleasure eating center within the brain. Some of the gut brain adjustments following bariatric surgery. So, you talked about how the gut cells stimulate your brain to release your appetite. Um, also, yeah, we talked about the reward centers. There are other uh, factors which are not relevant to this lecture, but basically improve your glucose metabolism. They have a beneficial effect on the liver and pancreas. And we know all of, almost all the satiety hormones are increased after that. So the understanding of a great understanding of the gut brain axis has given us a huge advantage in trying to target pharmacotherapy based on this gut peptide. So we're kind of mimicking the changes of the bariatric surgery in order to bring about weight loss. So the advantages, it's non-invasive, you don't have to undergo surgery, it's normal physiology, we're just trying to enhance the physiology. It's clearly got less side effects and complications if you look at gender and The disadvantages, most of these peptides are broken down very, very quickly in the selection. For example, JLP1 lasts only for two minutes. So that's not good enough. And the reason why they are broken down very quickly is because they're short term stimulation or regulators of appetite. They have to be injected like insulin, so if they are subcutaneous injections, and high doses bring about nausea. And this is kind of what I mentioned about how complex it is to just to replace a gut peptide to bring about weight loss because it's got multiple other signals and some of them may not be related entirely with your eating behavior. Clearly the future is to bring about breakdown resistance analog. Such an example is a liraglutide injection I mentioned. So it has a much longer half-life because it altered one amino acid in the whole GLP-1 molecule. So it all it kind of retains 97 homology to the endogenous GLP-1. And also the other option is to try different ways of treating. So there are very promising results on GLP-1 drugs, receptor agonist drugs in oral form. And also intranasal could be a route that you can explore. So if you look at the satiety curve, and I still feel classroom representation, say this is the physiological range, and this is satiety of feeling of fullness, and this is your meal size. So this would be kind of the curve that most people who are in the normal BMI will have. Unfortunately, in the obese state, it shifts to the right. That means you need a higher amount of meal to bring about the same amount of satiety. And we know with bariatric surgery, we're able to shift this the left. And that is even striking because we could go beyond what we have with the lean patient. Again, this is all clearly down to what we now know as the gut brain axis and the changes that the surgery brings about to encourage this change. So in conclusion, the gut brain axis is involved in regulation of appetite regulation of glucose and fat metabolism. Insulin secretion sensitivity, therefore it's got benefits in There's also some evidence to show it regulates bone metabolism. So there'll be more physiological functions in the future. I guess very much so that would be that would be what we can. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Have a good session. Thank you, Dr. Rice. I know that this is uh, early morning to you. Uh, you may be busy, but I hope you can stay with us for another few minutes. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, if you all have questions, you all can talk now. Dr. Rice will be with us for another few minutes. Okay, uh, uh, 
I want to ask something from you. Uh, what is your idea about intermittent fasting? Because we, uh, we used to practice uh, most of us uh, in uh, some times in our life, in the day to day, uh, we are practicing it, that intermittent fasting. What is your idea about intermittent fasting? Yeah, I think clearly there have been um, metabolic benefits shown with intermittent fasting, and I think it also will have an impact on the gut hormone cycle, and that could be one of the reasons why it's been effective. Um, I, I mean, personally, I've never tried it. <laughs> it's not something I have managed patients who've done intermittent fasting as much to see how they improve metabolically, but my understanding of it is basically what the evidence out there, and as you know, it does work for some patients, and if it works, we are not trying that. Uh, Dr. Roy, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, I'm Saman here from uh, Colombo South Teaching Hospital. Yeah, I can hear you. All uh, right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your very informative lecture. Uh, I have one question. Uh, can you can, can you uh, tell us some some types of foods which can which can modulate this uh, gut brain axis? Uh, the types of foods and particularly any any kind of uh, uh, exercises, you know, physiological exercises. Uh, which can be practiced by uh, a normal person, not not like in athlete, a person uh, who is having a routine office type of work. Can you recommend any any types of foods to modulate this gut brain axis? Yeah, I mean, my from what I know, it's food which are higher in protein content tend to stimulate the gut peptides more than sugars, for example, and even fat can stimulate this more. And I guess having a protein rich diet would help with any dietary program. Right. I personally, I don't consider myself a nutritionist. I, my only nutritional interest is in parental nutrition. So I wouldn't be able to advise specifically on diet intake. And in terms of exercise, moderate exercise, has been shown to increase gut peptides, so that would have a beneficial effect. And as we know, with exercise, it's not just about weight loss, it's the other metabolic benefits we get in terms of insulin sensitivity, lowering blood pressure, lowering your liquid levels. So those are the benefits. So I think um, if there are any clinical nutrition specialists in the audience, they may be the better place at answering that question. Right. Uh, what's, your, what's your view on uh, this carbo zero carbohydrate diet? Um, I think, yeah, again, because I'm not a clinical nutritionist in terms of oral diet, it's difficult for me to answer the question, but I think you need, I don't believe that you should have an entirely exclusion diet because you need a bit of everything. So my take is that as long as you have a balanced diet and you understand that obesity is not a phenomenon of just eating more calories and working out less, it's actually what we believe now is a chronic disease. As long as we understand that it's more to weight gain rather than just calories of intake, having a healthy diet, trying to help patients who can't lose weight even with good diet and exercise to kind of give them other modalities of treatment, either in the form of, yeah, it could be short term, like the gut peptide based pharma therapy, uh, which does help lose weight. And once you get the weight loss, then it may be easier for them to sustain it. But again, as I said, the body's metabolic changes are to kind of regain the weight, unfortunately. But again, I think it's a matter of working closely with the patients, being supportive and giving them lots of psychological support is key if they're going to address obesity. So um, personally, what I feel is we need to move away from the fact that just diet alone is enough. And if patients don't comply with the diet, we can't 
kind of point a finger at them because there could there is more to of these of these cities that could reward center signals and the regulation within the brain. So it has to be individualized and also working closely with the patients to see what works best for them. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Royce. Okay, uh, Dr. Royce, this is Gaya here. So uh, thank you. Hi, thank you very much for your comprehensive account on the hormones in the gut brain axis. So do you measure these hormones frequently or at least in your center? That like really. No, that's a good question. I think we are mainly research still. We don't always measure the cut peptide. We've done a lot of studies to see whether we, we could actually predict the patients who would lose more weight mm -hmm. after surgery if they had different amount of gut peptides after surgery, but that has not proven to be the case. So would patients who already have higher PYY would they go on to lose more weight, but it's not proven to be correct. So it's very much um, research. But okay. we do be able to measure almost all the gut peptides I mentioned in our laboratory here. Now it's just in okay. But leptins and things you could measure. Yeah, leptin and adiponectin, those are available more routinely. And uh, they use kind of some obesity panels, do use those uh, markers. They're beginning to measure more cytokine panels because we know we've got the chronic inflammatory status in this obesity region. So they kind of interesting more and more biomarkers, but in terms of this ghrelin or PYY, GLP-1, it's not routinely available because we could understand the physiology, but it's difficult to see what else we can do with it at the moment. Okay, but this uh, your speech is a very good eye opener to all of us to study more about this. Uh, hormones in the gut brain axis and importance. Yeah, definitely. And I think uh, that's a lot of interest with the, with the obesity pandemic that the epidemic is going. It's, it's just understanding it more, there's more clinical research and better understanding of how we can help our patients in the future. Dr. Royce, uh, there is uh, one question at chat box. Uh, yeah. Asking, uh, are there any differences in the adjustment of gut brain axis after sleep gastrectomy and bypass surgery? Okay, that's a good question. I'll see if I can go back to one of my slides. Okay, so if you look at this uh, diagram, so you've got the sleep gastrectomy and the gastric bypass. As you can see in sleep gastrectomy, the difference to bypass is they make an incision whereas, whereas they can remove the entire, nearly two thirds of the stomach is removed, mainly the outer curvature, which contains the ghrelin producing cells. And this bit of the stomach is discarded. So you can't reverse the sleep gastrectomy, unfortunately. Whereas in Ruan Y gastric bypass, that bit is retained because. It is connected to your pancreas, your liver, so you need the duodenum bit. But because we make an incision right down the middle here, you don't have that, but you lose the cells which produce ghrelin. So the impact of ghrelin changes are very similar. So you get decreased ghrelin, whether it's uh, bypass or sleep. And again, because the food tends to go a bit quicker, because there's a bit of a rapid pass through, you do get increased and um, exaggerated response of GLP-1 and PYY even after gastric sleep. So the metabolic changes and the physiology is quite similar after both procedures. And that's why sleep is proving very popular because it's a simpler procedure and you get similar benefits of weight loss and also glucose metabolism. I also need to add because the sleep this newer procedure, we don't have as much data as we have with this. I think it is time to end the meeting. I invite uh, Dr. Tushara Heva Gigana, and he is the Joint Secretary CCPSL and Consultant Chemical Pathologist of 
teaching hospital Anuradhapura uh, to deliver thanking words. Thank you, Kisali. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Roy, uh, Dr. Royce P. Vincent, consultant chemical pathologist, King's College Hospital, NHS Foundation Trust, and honorary senior lecturer at King's College, London, UK, on behalf of the College of Chemical Pathologist, Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Dr. Royce, for delivering that excellent and thought provocating lecture amidst of your busy schedule. Please accept our token of appreciation, which will be sent to you soon. I also thank uh, Dr. Ruvini Ranasinghe, currently working at King's College Hospital, London, UK, for coordinating this event with us. And also, I thank all the participants who join us this occasion from all over the country. Without you, this event won't be a success. Thank you very much. Over to you, Kisali. Okay, thank you, Tushara, and thank you, Dr. Royce, uh, again. And uh, we will uh, meet you with another uh, webinar in another two weeks' time. Thank you to all.